Hello, and welcome to Grand Dukes of the West, episode 13, Courtly Love and Courtly Life. Today we continue our detour from the narrative to cover Philip the Bold's patronage of the arts and the structure of the Burgundian court. Before we get started today, I'd like to note that I'll be talking about a fair number of artists and works of art today. As this is not a visual medium, I highly suggest looking up many of these. To make things easy for you, I'll be including many of the works of art featured here on the website page for this episode at granddukesofthewest.com. Furthermore, once again, I'd like to thank Emmanuel Dubois from the Lafayette We Are Here podcast for helping me out with some of the French pronunciation in this episode. He also recently recorded two episodes on the Hundred Years' War, so if you're impatient for me to get to Agincourt, Joan of Arc, or any of the other big events in the latter half of the conflict, you should definitely check out Lafayette We Are Here. And finally, before we get started, I'd like to thank my patrons. Christine, Comte de Chenonceau, Count of Chenonceau, Elliot, Heer von Gravenstein, Lord of Gravenstein, and Craig, Chevalier de Duché, Knight of the Duchy. Thank you so much for your support. If you want to join them, make your way to patreon.com slash Burgundy. Anyways, on with the show. The later Burgundian court had a reputation for being one of the most lavish in Europe, and the early Netherlandish school of painting, also known as the Flemish Primitives, finds its origins in the workshops patronized by the ducal court. The Burgundian courts of Philip the Bold and John the Fearless didn't command arts and culture to the same degree as the court of Philip the Good, but the first two dukes were still prominent patrons of the arts. All of this should be taken within the context of the time. The 14th century saw courts from all over Europe expanding in opulence and patronage. In fact, all the sons of John the Good would be prominent patrons of the arts. Of course, the preeminent of these was Charles V. But although his brothers had fewer resources to command, they still made their mark on the art world. So let's dive into the arts. Every book, book chapter, and article that I found on Philip the Bold's patronage of the arts seems to start with, well, books. So I'll start there as well. This is, of course, before Gutenberg brought the printing press with movable type to Europe. So at this point, the vast majority of books were hand copied, and a minority would have been printed from wood blocks. The 1360s saw the rise of the court library, and the two most impressive of these libraries were those of Charles V at the Louvre and of Galeazzo Visconti, the Lord of Milan. Both of these men had over a thousand books in their collection, and the contents of which ranged from religious texts to classical texts to histories to courtly romances and much more. The prince's collections provide an interesting window into the state of thought right on the precipice of the Renaissance. I won't be getting into this quite so much this episode, but if you are interested in thought, philosophy, and culture during the Burgundian period, I recommend checking out The Waning of the Middle Ages by Johann Heisinger. The book can feel a little dated at times. It was written almost 100 years ago in its defense, but it remains a solid survey on the topic. If you're interested in listening to something more than reading, there is a free audiobook by LibriVox. Philip the Bold had his own collection of manuscripts, and although it was much smaller than that of his brother Charles at around 200, it was still one of the largest of the time. Like that of all his brothers, Philip's collection contains quite a bit of variation. There were religious works ranging from prayer books and books of hours to Bibles, and even some of the writings of Pope Gregory the Great. One of the most famous manuscripts from this era is the Très Richesseur, owned by Philip's older brother, John, Duke of Berry. I highly recommend looking up the Très Richesseur, as it is one of the best examples of an illuminated or illustrated manuscript from the later Middle Ages. The creators of the Très Richesseur were the Limburg brothers, Dutch painters who made their way to the court of Philip the Bold. Despite the common belief that all thought and art in the Middle Ages was dedicated to religion, secular books made up a greater portion of Philip's library, as they do with his brothers. Here, there are some copies of Greco-Roman works from antiquity, such as a collection of Livy's writings and some books of Greek philosophy. However, medieval European books tend to outweigh these relics from pre-Christian times. Nonfiction works, and I'm using that term quite loosely here, such as bestiaries, atlases, and histories are quite common among Philip's collection, with histories taking pride of place among the three, something that I have in common with Philip. Among the histories, we also see a fair range of topics covered, 
Chronicles of France and Flanders have their place in the library, as do histories of the Crusades, ranging from biographies of Godfrey of Bouillon, the Low Country noble who became the first Christian king of Jerusalem, and other crusaders, to Saladin, to general histories of the Holy Land. Furthermore, the classical world is not forgotten in these histories, as histories of Troy, here medieval interpretations of the Homeric cycle rather than direct translations, and other various tales from classical Greece and Rome find their place as well. Of course, it's quite difficult to define and demarcate genres here, as there was quite some overlap. The crusading histories can easily be considered religious texts, especially when biography can turn into hagiography. Additionally, many of the histories, with the exception of some chronicles, can be seen as courtly romances as much as histories. So what was a courtly or chivalric romance? The chivalric romance was one of the defining genres of court writing in the late Middle Ages. A courtly romance generally had a hero going on a quest to prove his love for a lady. The other popular genre of the time was the chanson de geste, which tended to emphasize heroic deeds, the name literally translates to something along the lines of Song of Deeds. The Chanson de Geste reached its height of popularity around the 12th and 13th centuries, but it remained popular into the Burgundian period. The most famous Chanson de Geste is probably the Song of Roland, a story about a battle between a group of Franks led by Roland and Muslims from Spain. It should be noted that the battle in the Song of Roland actually happened, although the reality was quite different from how it was portrayed in the Chanson de Geste. The courtly romance differs from the Chanson de Geste for its focus on love and manners as opposed to feats of bravery in battle. The most popular courtly romance during the later Middle Ages was the Romance of the Rose, which, despite being written in the 1200s, reached its peak popularity in the 14th and 15th centuries. The Romance of the Rose featured liberal use of personified allegories. Beauty, generosity, and love are all characters that help the hero in his journey, while danger, shame, and fear stand in his way, and the whole story takes place within a garden. The goal of the hero is to plug the rose, symbolizing both the lady love of the hero and her sexuality. The romance of the rose, although popular, was not universally loved. The two biggest critiques of it came from the church, who thought it was too vulgar and sexual, and from women, who objected to its portrayal of them as fickle, feeble seductresses. Although Philip the Bold was a fan of the romance, owning multiple manuscripts of it, he employed two outspoken critics of it. The first of these was Jean Gerson, at the time a young student at the University of Paris, who, with the help of Philip the Bold's patronage, eventually became the chancellor of the university, and one of the most influential theologians of the later Middle Ages. Another receiver of Philip's patronage was Christine de Pizan. De Pizan was the daughter of a court astrologer of Charles V, and when her husband and father died, she was left alone with three children and so became a court writer to support her family. Christine de Pizan is one of my favorite figures in the late medieval literary scene, and the few minutes that I spend on her here won't really do her justice. If there's any interest in learning more about her, let me know, and I might dedicate a supplemental episode to her down the line. De Pizan worked in the courts of Philip the Bold and John the Fearless, but also the French royal court, the court of John, Duke of Berry, Louis, Duke of Orléans, and many more. Her writings, like her patrons, show a wide variety. She wrote a chronicle of the life of King Charles V and a biography of Joan of Arc, as well as a handful of other histories. Christine de Pizan also dabbled in philosophy and political treatises, as well as writing a few courtly romances and allegorical poems. Perhaps her most famous works relate to her struggle against the misogynist attitudes of the time. She was a fierce critic of the Romance of the Rose, and even wrote The Tale of the Rose as a response to it. The Tale of the Rose sparked a debate on the merits of the Romance of the Rose, with de Pizan and Gerson on one side, and a handful of other thinkers and writers on the other. Two of her other proto-feminist works are The Book of the City of Ladies and The Treasure of the City of Ladies. The book and the treasure serve as indirect responses to the romance of the rose. Here, Christine de Pizan builds an allegorical city filled with famous women from history and mythology, as well as many female saints. These works serve to promote the virtues of women and dismiss characterizations like that from the romance of the rose. In these books, de Pizan also emphasized the skills and talents of women and encouraged their education and presence in society. The treasure of the city of ladies was written for Margaret of Burgundy, a daughter of Duke John the Fearless, in part to promote her education.
Jean Gerson and Christine de Pizan weren't the only writers patronized by Philip the Bold, but I will omit, at least for now, the others for fear of overwhelming you with names. Works produced for Philip range from poetry to romance to history to theology and so much more. The Duke even commissioned French translations of famous texts in other languages. The Burgundian court may have been a center of literary patronage, but it's also important to not overstate the impact that it had on the burgeoning humanist thought. As Richard Vaughn puts it, quote, In character, this patronage was essentially conservative, for it was limited to writers in the medieval tradition of chivalry and the crusade, of courtly love and of didactic and allegorical works. There is no sign at the Burgundian court of the humanism which was infiltrating into France at the time, and which is apparent, though to a limited extent, in John of Berry, Louis of Orléans, and Louis of Bourbon. But within this medieval tradition, Philip was an average patron, and sometimes even a participant. Philip himself helped to found a Cour d'Amour, a court of love, along with Louis, Duke of Bourbon. The court of love was an early literary society dedicated to lyric poetry and to honoring women. The concept dates back to the High Middle Ages, and Eleanor of Aquitaine is probably the historical figure most closely associated with it. To quote Johann Heisinger's The Waning of the Middle Ages, quote, The business of the court much resembled that of a rhetorical chamber. There were debates in the form of amorous lawsuits to defend different opinions. The ladies distributed the prizes, and poems attacking the honor of women were forbidden. Unfortunately, very little survives from the court of love, and so, as much as I would love to include some of Philip the Bold's own poetry in this episode, I cannot find any. So, now let's move on from the written word to the woven image. It shouldn't surprise you to hear that tapestry was one of the main art forms of the Middle Ages, and with the preeminence of the Low Countries in the world of dyed cloth, it also shouldn't surprise you to hear that Philip the Bold had a huge collection of them. Philip's collection of tapestries ranged from showing religious imagery to scenes from various chansons de geste to episodes from history. Religious tableaux could show scenes from the lives of Jesus and Mary or from other various saints' lives. The most popular here were the saints which various members of the ducal family had a special connection towards. Saint Louis appears in many tapestries, as do Saint Denis and Saint John, all emphasizing the Burgundian connection to the royal court. Yet again, we see many other scenes without the religious element. Scenes from the tale of Jason and the Argonauts appear in the tapestries, most notably for the future of the Burgundian court, including the Golden Fleece. We also see scenes from medieval tales such as Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. And once more, history has its place among the tapestries as well. Saint Louis, Charlemagne, Godfrey of Bouillon, and some other lords from the past 500 or so years appear throughout Philip's collection. More recent events also made their way into the loom, such as depictions of Bertrand du Guesclin, the Eagle of Brittany. In one of my favorite displays of haughtiness, Philip had a tapestry made in the wake of the Battle of Rosebeck, depicting the defeat of von Artevelde's forces. However, rather than hang up the tapestry as was the common practice, Philip the Bold used it as a rug, and thus was able to walk on Philip von Artevelde and the rebellious Gentinars for the rest of his life. The tapestries did not only depict events. Scenes from nature were common, as were simple scenes such as a shepherd herding some sheep. In an almost touching display, the Marguerite Daisy appears in many of these tapestries, an homage to Philip's wife Margaret. The Marguerite was also a common motif on Philip's livery, a term used to describe someone's outfit, and often the uniforms of their staff and retainers. Liveries were another way to mark status and as the Dukes of Burgundy controlled the center of production for the highest quality cloth, they could often be expected to have impeccable clothes. Still, sometimes even high quality wool cloth isn't enough. The Duke, the Ducal family, and some of the high courtiers were often decked out in silk, satin, cloth of gold, and velvet, often supplied by the Lucchese Rapondi Company. I swear, I'll do a formal introduction to the Rapondi soon enough. On these fine clothes were often additional decorations. I already mentioned marguerites, but all sorts of plants and animals were used. Some of Philip's favorite decorations were embroidered swans and ewes. These animals sometimes even had collars around their necks with little bells attached. But clothes weren't the only outlet for Philip's love of extravagance. The court itself was the center of Philip's lifestyle. The size of the court was not static, with courtiers coming and going and servants being hired as needed. But at its height, there could be hundreds of members of Philip's entourage. 
Chefs, squires, waiters, confessors, barbers, musicians, physicians, and more were all fixtures of the court, as were people with more specific roles. For example, the panateri was tasked with making sure that the court always had enough bread, while the echelsonnerie did the same for wine. The hunt was another fixture of court life, and a staff of two dozen or so falconers was usually kept on hand. The only thing that nobles in this period were more obsessed with than hunting were tournaments and feasts. Admittedly, many nobles probably preferred hunting, but I'm trying to do a segue here. We've already seen Philip host some tournaments and feasts on this show. Both his wedding and the double wedding at Combray saw them put on, as did his assumption of Louis of Malas counties. We also saw an international tournament put on in Bruges during the peace talks between Philip and John of Gaunt. These tournaments both served to entertain the masses and gave nobles a chance to show off their talents and arms in a public and relatively, key word here, relatively, safe manner. Jousts are the best known form of the tournament today, but in the late Middle Ages, the melee was the most popular. The joust, of course, saw two knights with lances trying to knock each other off their horse, while the melee saw a whole host of knights engage in a mock battle. Sometimes they were split into teams, and sometimes it was every man for himself. The goal of this battle was to capture, and subsequently ransom, as many enemy knights as possible. The melee thus also became a lucrative practice for those skilled in combat. Along with a tournament, always came a feast. Feasts were common occurrences and were at the center of courtly life. They provided another opportunity for hosts to show off their wealth. Hundreds of animals could be slaughtered for a feast, and specialties could be imported from the Levant. Feasts also served as a good occasion to dispense with gifts. Gifts were another important part of the court system. They served to reinforce patronage networks and to build alliances. Philip was an avid gift giver, and a significant part of the Burgundian budget was dedicated to gift giving. These gifts could range from fine items to good food or a barrel of bon wine, to cash, to fiefs, and really straddled the line of gift and bribe. But gifts weren't limited to the nobility. The practice of almsgiving was common at the Burgundian court, and wherever Philip went, he was sure to dispense with them liberally. Philip even founded his own order of chivalry, known as the Order of the Golden Tree. The insignia of this order was a golden tree with an eagle and a lion. Apparently, the cost of these emblems were so high that Philip had to return his own to cut down on the total cost. While the Order of the Golden Tree is all but forgotten today and overshadowed by his grandson's Order of the Golden Fleece, Philip the Bold's order does demonstrate his own mastery of both court etiquette and gift-giving. Of course, Philip was also a big receiver of gifts. In fact, the finances of Burgundy were generally kept afloat by a steady stream of money from the royal treasury categorized as various gifts. Although, I don't know how much this really qualifies as a gift when Philip was the one in charge of the royal court. But in times when the royal cash wasn't coming in, such as when Philip was no longer pulling the strings of the king, some of his finery could be sold. Philip had an immense collection of gold and silver dishes and utensils. These goods were both an indicator of wealth and a rainy day fund. Many of my sources refer to, quote, melting down plate in times of need, and that's a literal description. If necessary, the tableware could be melted down and sold to cover some liquidity crisis that the Duke was facing. Tableware wasn't all, of course. Philip and Margaret had an expansive collection of gold and jewelry. According to Richard Vaughn, Margaret had a passion for personal adornment. Her collection includes a handful of crowns, necklaces, rings, jeweled clasps, jeweled belts and chains, and many more various adornments. In fact, the Duke had a goldsmith on retainer. Various items were collected by the Duke and his brothers. As was the fashion of the time, Philip was an avid collector of relics and religious miscellany and boasted some pieces of the true cross, allegedly, reliquaries, statues of saints, altar pieces, and gold crucifixes. Philip also owned a cup once owned by Julius Caesar, again, allegedly. He had a handful of other collections, including a menagerie which featured a leopard given to him by the Duke of Milan. The crown jewel in the Duke's collection of curios would have to be the Castle of Hesdin. This castle, built by Robert of Artois before he died in the Battle of the Golden Spurs in 1302, was filled to the brim with medieval automata. Known as Engins de Batement, or Engines of Amusement, these automata pranked guests at the castle as they walked through. One room had a trap door hidden that would drop an unsuspecting guest into a pile of feathers. 
Another room was rigged to mimic a storm, and so would spray water from the ceiling and mimic the sound of thunder. There were statues throughout the castle that could speak, and others who could move. Pipes were even rigged up throughout the castle to spray visitors with water. A particular favorite of the Counts was to have pipes peeking up from the floor to, quote, wet the ladies from below. When Hesden passed to Philip, it was in a state of disrepair, but he spent a good deal of time and money restoring it. In doing so, Hesden became one of the centers of his artistic patronage. Painters and sculptors were employed to restore and maintain these engines of amusement and to further decorate the castle. Chief among these artists was Melchior Bruderlam. Bruderlam was given the court rank of valet de chambre and was tasked with decorating a gallery in which many of the engines would be placed. Many of the artists employed on a regular basis by the duke would be granted the title valet de chambre, which essentially gave them a large salary in exchange for being on hand to work on whatever the duke wanted. Perhaps one of Bruderlam's best legacies is as a forebearer of the early Netherlandish school of painting. We are still a little ways away from the beginnings of that school, but we can trace some of its origins to painters who worked for Philip the Bold. Another of the painters granted the rank of valet de chambre was Jan Malville. The Limburg brothers who produced the Très Richesseur were actually nephews of Jan Malville, which explains how they made their way into Philip's service. Melville, Bruderlam, and other Low Country painters were employed to create all sorts of work, but the most important task given to his court painters was the decoration of the Charter House at Champmol. Despite all of Philip's love of extravagance, he wished to be buried in the habit of a Carthusian monk. But don't let that fool you into thinking his tomb would be simple. If anything, I've saved the best for last. The Charter House of Champmol was the crowning achievement of Philip's patronage of the arts. The Charter House was a Carthusian monastery built to house 24 monks. We already see Philip being bold, as the typical Carthusian monastery held a dozen. The Capetian Dukes of Burgundy had been buried at Citeaux, while Philip's grandfather, father, and brother were buried at the Abbey of Saint-Denis. The Chartreuse de Champmol was Philip's attempt to mark his new dynasty by rivaling both. He started by bringing the architect who designed the Louvre Palace to Dijon to design the Charter House. But while Champmol was by all accounts a complex of beautiful buildings, the real treasure was what was inside. As I mentioned previously, painters employed by the Duke were tasked with decorating the Charter House. They painted panels, altarpieces, walls, furniture, sculpture, and more. Everything was intricately decorated by the most talented workmen of the day. Interestingly enough, it seems that Philip was really looking low when it comes to his court artists. Just about everyone that painted or sculpted for the Charter House was from the Low Countries. The most influential of these artists, and possibly the most influential and best-known artist I'll talk about at all today, with the possible exception of Christine de Pizan, was Klaus Sluter. Klaus Sluter was born in Harlem in Holland, and started his career in Brussels in Brabant. In Brussels, Sluter became the assistant to the Flemish sculptor Jean de Marville. Marville then entered the Duke's service, bringing Sluter with him to Dijon. When Marville died in 1389, Sluter inherited his position of valet de chambre and his job of creating sculpture for the Charter House of Champmol. From here, Sluter's talents were put on full display. The sculpture at the Chartreuse de Champmol was arguably the finest of all medieval European sculpture. While Klaus Sluter created some sculptures for the Duke on other occasions, his talents were chiefly put to work decorating the Charter House. But I don't want to give you the impression that Sluter worked alone. Many other sculptors, primarily from the Low Countries, worked alongside Sluter both on the Charter House and on other projects. It's mostly that Klaus Sluter's work stands apart from the other sculpture of the period. Unfortunately, much of Sluter's work has either been destroyed or lost, as with a number of artists mentioned today. But what survives is quite remarkable. I know I've been telling you to look up a lot of stuff this episode, but seriously, look up some of Klaus Sluter's work. I'll also make sure to include some of it on the website page for this episode. Sluter's best-known works are housed in the Charter House. He's probably best known for The Well of Moses, a complex scene consisting of a depiction of the crucifixion of Jesus, now lost unfortunately, atop a column encircled by prophets and angels. Sluter also sculpted a series of figures that greet a visitor as they enter the chapel, and a series of pleurons, or mourning figures, around Philip's tomb. Sluter's art style departed from the highly stylized sculpture that was popular at the time and focused more on realism. His sculpture did not, however, embrace realism to the complete neglect of the Gothic style. In him, we find a middle ground between the overly exaggerated sculpture of the Gothic style 
and the simplified, almost stoic sculpture of the later Renaissance. The figures carry a weight with them. They display their emotion and feeling without dipping into caricature. Sluder's figures are full and lived in. This might have struck the medieval viewer even more than it would you or I, as they would have been illustrated by Jan Malville and Gilded as well. Sluder died before he could finish Philip's tomb, but the work was continued by his nephew and protege, Klaus de Verve. And so, Philip was buried in a simple monk's robe, but in a magnificent sarcophagus. Surrounding his tomb were 24 Carthusian monks saying prayers for his soul. But now let's back up a little bit. We still have a good deal of narrative to cover before sealing Philip the Bold away in his tomb at Champmol. Next time, we'll return to the narrative and see how Philip dealt with no longer being in the inner circle. We'll also get a look at that inner circle and finally meet Louis of Orléans, the king's no-good brother who is leading the kingdom into ruin, at least if you believe John the Fearless. However, that episode will be in four weeks again, as I am taking some time off for the holidays and the new year. Now I'd like to respond to some patron questions from the last episode. The first one, you mentioned Philip's acquisition of Charolais as being a consolidation of Burgundy. What was the status of this county with the Capetian Dukes of Burgundy, and did they exert their influence over it, even if they didn't have rights to it? So Charolais was technically a part of Burgundy, but it was ruled by one of Philip's vassals. So when Philip purchased the county, it was more that he extended direct control to it, rather than having a vassal rule it in his name. Secondly, how did Philip justify his reneging of his promise to return French-speaking Flanders to the crown? Did his lawyers come up with fancy reasons for why it was not possible for him to do so right now? Or was it more of a what-are-you-going-to-do-about-it situation? So, I think that if Charles V had been alive when Louis of Mala died, Philip would have probably ended up returning Gallican Flanders. However, as the king was now Charles VI, Philip was able to use his position on the Regency Council to get out of returning the territory. The court of Charles VI requested several times for the return of Gallican Flanders, and each time Philip made an excuse such that he had promised Louis of Mala that he would keep it united with Flanders proper, or that Charles V hadn't really meant it when he made Philip promise to return the territories. Eventually, Philip was able to use his influence to get the king to drop the subject and formally grant Gallican Flanders over to him. However, the king only really granted it to Philip and his direct heir, hoping that in the future France would be in a better position and the Duke of Burgundy in a less influential one. But that didn't really work out under Philip the Good. Philip the Bold was in such a strong position here that he even made Charles VI repay the portion of Margaret of Mala's bride price that Philip had paid, when it was originally split between him and Charles V. If you want me to address a question about a previous episode, or just something generally related to Valois Burgundy, you can join my Patreon at patreon.com slash Valois Burgundy. Thank you so much for listening. If you like the show, I would really appreciate it if you would rate and review it on Apple Podcasts or your platform of choice, and tell your friends about it. If you want to keep up with the show, you can follow me at twitter.com slash Valois Burgundy, mas.to slash at Valois Burgundy, or find Grand Dukes of the West on Facebook. You can also email me at granddukesofthewest at gmail.com and check out the podcast website at granddukesofthewest.com.